Christianity would have you believe that Jesus, the Son, is part of a trinity. Christianity would have you believe that Jesus is the physical Son of God. The term Son of God is not something new that was only expressly used to refer to Jesus. It is a term that was used throughout the Tanakh. First, let's look at the Christian Bible's usage of the term as it references back to the Tanakh. Matthew 4, verses 5 and 6. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Luke 4, verses 9 through 11. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. These verses are references back to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. For he will order his angels to guard you wherever you go. They will carry you in their hands, lest you hurt, hurt your foot on a stone. Psalm 91 was written by Moses as a means of comforting the children of Israel during their wandering in the wilderness. Moses is comforting the children of Israel and letting them know that God is there to comfort them and protect them. God has sent angels to protect the people from literally and figuratively harming themselves during their time in the wilderness. Notice that in the very last verse of this chapter, there is a reference to long life. Psalm 91 verse 16 I will let him live to a ripe old age and show him my salvation. This obviously does not refer to Jesus, but in fact does refer to the children of Israel. Hebrews 7 verses 1 through 3 For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. This is a reference back to the king and priest Melchizedek, who brought food and blessings to Abraham after Abraham defeated the kings. Genesis 14 verses 18 through 20 And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him, saying, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your foes into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. This obviously does not refer to Jesus, since he was neither king nor a priest. The verse in Hebrews makes absolutely no sense. It references the fact that Melchizedek had no father or mother, no genealogy, and was always in existence. Where does the Torah say that Melchizedek had no father or mother? Wouldn't this fact, if it were true, make Melchizedek a god? Wouldn't this actually make him superior to Jesus, since Jesus had a biological mother? Just because Melchizedek's genealogy was not listed does not mean that he was not a human being. If Melchizedek had always existed, wouldn't that also make him a god? Next, let's look at two specific instances of the Christian Bible's usage of the term Son of God that was modified by the scribes. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Alexandrian type texts read, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. This includes the Codex Sinaiticus, which was written in the 4th century CE. Byzantine type texts read, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. This includes the Codex Alexandrinus, which was written in the 6th century CE. Why is this important? A 
according to Bart Ehrman. A well-known example comes in Matthew 24, verse 36, where Jesus is predicting the end of the age and says that concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor even the Son, but only the Father. Scribes found this passage difficult. The Son of God, Jesus himself, does not know when the end will come. How could that be? Isn't he all-knowing? To resolve this problem, some scribes simply modified the text by taking out the words, nor even the Son. Mark 1 verse 1 The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God The 4th century CE text Codex Vaticanus does include the text, the Son of God. However, the 4th century Codex Sinaiticus excludes this part of the text. According to Bruce Metzger, since the combination of B, D, W, all in support of Son of God, is extremely strong, it was not thought advisable to omit the words altogether. Yet because of the antiquity of the shorter reading and the possibility of scribal expansion, it was decided to enclose the words within square brackets. As we can see, there are issues with the Christian Bible's use of the term Son of God as it pertains to Jesus. There are clearly two references back to the Tanakh, which are completely unsubstantiated. These references do not refer to Jesus in any way. There are also two instances of passages that are clearly scribal interpolations. This means that these two passages from the Christian Bible must be thrown out. One of the earliest writings of Christianity that has survived is the Didache, which makes no mention of Jesus being the Son of God. In fact, Jesus is viewed as a prophet and servant of God, a very similar idea expressed in the Quran. According to the Biblical Archaeology Review, November-December 2012, perhaps the most significant element of the Didache's doctrine concerns its understanding of Jesus. This primitive Judeo-Christian writing contains none of the theological ideas of Paul about the redeeming Christ or of John's divine word or logos. Jesus is never called the Son of God. Astonishingly, this expression is found only once in the Didache, where it is the self-designation of the Antichrist, the seducer of the world. Didache Chapter 16 For in the last days false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied, and the sheep shall be turned into wolves, and love shall be turned into hate. For when lawlessness increases, they shall hate and persecute and betray one another, and then shall appear the world deceiver as son of God, and shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered into his hands, and he shall do iniquitous things which have not yet come to pass since the beginning. Also according to the Biblical Archaeology Review, the only title assigned to Jesus in the Judeo-Christian Didache is the Greek term peace, which means either servant or child. However, as Jesus shares this designation in relation to God with King David, it is clear that it must be rendered as God's servant. If so, the Didache uses only the lowliest Christological qualification about Jesus. Didache Chapter 9 And concerning the broken bread, we thank thee, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you made known to us through Jesus your servant. To you be the glory forever even as this broken bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. According to Biblical Archaeology Review, the switch in the perception of Jesus from charismatic prophet to superhuman being coincided with a geographical and religious change when the Christian preaching of the gospel moved from the Galilean Judean Jewish culture to the pagan surroundings of the Greco-Roman world. The term Son of God is used copiously throughout the Tanakh in reference to both man and angels. This term in no way is an indication of a personage of God becoming flesh and allegedly dying for our sins. Mark 1 verse 2 